Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I'm offering you today a full-length video of a panel discussion that I participated in a few weeks ago. And this discussion entitled, Was India's Partition Inevitable, was organized by the Argumentative Indians. This is an organization they have a website as well as a YouTube channel, so I highly encourage you to check their YouTube channel out. I'll post the link in the description. And about five scholars participated in this discussion from various parts of philosophical and regional affiliations, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. I really thoroughly enjoyed the experience and would love to be part of any other future projects by the argumentative Indians. I think they are doing a great service and they are elevating the level of discourse about the region, about India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, about the subcontinent in general. And we need more and more of these conversations. So before you watch the video, please remember this was produced by the argumentative Indians and is being posted here with their permission and the links to their website as well as their YouTube channel are in the description and please take a few moments to join them. Thank you and here we go. The partition of India was one of the most tragic events experienced by humanity in modern times. It is estimated 1 million people were killed and 12 million more made homeless. Painful loss of family members and loved ones to mindless violence have left the collective memories scarred on both sides of the border created by the partition. Even as we approach 75 years since this momentous event, we have never ceased to wonder and question what if. The reasons that led to the partition and its very legitimacy continue to remain highly contested. While many accuse independent leaders like Gandhi and Nehru, others lay the blame squarely on the British connivance, and yet others trace the seeds of division in the very birth of the Muslim League. The defenders of each side claim their powerlessness in the face of the inevitable partition. But was it really inevitable? To revisit and re-examine this, we have with us a panel of highly eminent and learned experts. I'm honored to uh, state that we have with us today Dr. Ishtiaf Ahmed, who is the Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Stockholm University and Editor in General of the Liberal Arts and Social Sciences International Journal. We have Dr. Sucheta Mahajan, who is the Professor and former Chairperson at the Center for Historical Studies, JNU. We have Dr. Masood Ashraf Raja, who is Associate Professor of Post-Colonial post post Literature <laughs> and Theory at the University of North Texas, and the editor of Pakistaniyat, a journal of Pakistan studies. We have Mr. Surendra Kulkarni, an Indian politician, socio-political activist, author, and columnist. And we have Mr. Abhijit Chavra, who is a researcher and writer on topics of history and geopolitics, as well as the founder and host of a highly popular podcast, Ask Abhijit. Welcome all of you to Argumentative Indians. It's an honor to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. To, to kickstart, I would like to invite Dr. Ahmed um, to address the main topic of today's session. Was the partition inevitable? No, I don't think so. I think it was a last minute decision of the departing uh, British Empire. And uh, let me put the order in which this partition thing came on the, became center stage. Uh, of course, on both sides, Hindus and Muslims, since at least the second half of the 19th century had been talking about a partition in which Hindus and Muslims will be separated from one another and given separate states. But, uh, this was confronted by the emergence of the Indian National Congress 
as an open party for all Indians. So this idea of a partition remained on the peripheries until about 1936-37. Then it moves center stage. And on the 22nd of March, 1940, uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the president of the Muslim League, in his marathon speech, lays down what I've called the foundational uh, basis of the ideology, the two nation theory or ideology. On the 23rd and 24th, then there was uh, speeches made in, in support of the Lahore resolution demanding that in the northeastern and northwestern parts of the subcontinent, where Muslims were in a majority, they be separated to create Muslim states which would be independent and sovereign. Within a week, the Sikh leader, Sardar uh, Sundar Singh Majitia of the Sikh Nationalist Party said that uh, if the Muslims want India partitioned on the basis of religion, we will resist being included in a communal Pakistan. And we would want the non-Muslim districts of the Punjab be separated and given to a Sikh state or to India. Now we can move forward and then the British, I have argued all along in my recent book, especially Jinnah, his successes, failures and role in history, but even the earlier two books, which are related to the partition, the Punjab bloodied, partitioned and cleansed, and then Pakistan, the garrison state. In all three, I've shown that the British had no plans of leading the subcontinent in 1943, when the penultimate uh, Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten took over from Lord Linlithgow. Linlithgow told him that we, have, we'll, we are here for another 30 years. That would be 1973. But of course, this was a delusional uh, uh, statement because the Second World War, although the Allies won it, but British economy, industry, capacity to maintain and sustain an empire in India was not possible anymore. So then they came up with the idea of the cabinet mission plan in which a loose Indian federation with three groups which had a right every 10 years to decide whether they want to remain, it, remain in it or not. And the princely states were free to decide either to join India or to Pakistan or to remain independent. That plan was rejected by the Congress on grounds that without an effective center, there was no chance that you could keep India united. Jinnah accepted that, but said that we will do everything because uh, to ensure that we get Pakistan. If we couldn't get it today, that's our objective, ultimate objective. Then, of course, you have uh, uh, Mountbatten coming in March 1947. He talks to all the leaders. And then on the 3rd of June 1947, finally, a partition plan is set forth, which requires that not only that Hindu and Muslim areas of India will be separated and given to two independent dominions. Also in Bengal and Punjab, which were Muslim majority provinces, uh, the two assemblies split into two Hindu and Muslim majority districts will vote whether they wanted to keep their provinces united and part of Pakistan or give to India. And if they decide in favor of partition, then those areas will be given to India. Earlier uh, in, in uh, April 1947, in Bengal, an idea was floated that uh, and, and, and it was, I think, Sarad Bose and Sor Vardi saying, we want to keep Bengal united. That was then challenged by Mr. Mukherjee of the Hindu Mahasabha and then supported by the Congress. So if you look at the order in which this demand for partition actually emerged from one to another, then it is as late as 3 June 1947 and then the voting 
in the two assemblies on the 20th June and 23rd June in favor of partition. And then the partition, the transfer of power was so badly organized that ultimately, as you gave the figure, 1 million killed. And according to my studies, 14 to 15 million people uprooted to cross the Red Cliff line in search of safe havens. So the whole idea that India will be partitioned and partitioned in this way is a very, very late arrival. Just before I finish, I, I should mention a very important role played by the British Army. On the 12th of May, of May 1946, the Supreme Commander in the subcontinent, uh, uh, Field Marshal Okinlek, had to write a memorandum, should there be Pakistan or not? And he concluded, no, if we have Pakistan, we will have a partitioned India, and that would be an invitation to the Soviet Union to march in, because India wouldn't have the British Indian Army, its prize creation, to defend India. Then on the 12th of May 1947, there is a complete 100% about turn. And the three heads of the British Armed Forces, the hero of the Second World War, Field Mar Marshal Montgomery, and some people from the colonial office prepare a memorandum saying that Mr. Jinnah is willing to join the Commonwealth. We should ask for Karachi port facilities, Pakistan airfields, and Muslim manpower to be at the disposal of the British, whereas Hindustan may go its own way because they did not trust Nehru and the left wing of the Congress who were going to come to maybe would lead India forward. So for me, the partition of India is a very, very, very late arrival on the, uh, you know, on the table. And that's it. So I'll, I'll finish here. Thank you, sir. So, if, so do I, is it, would it be fair to say that you think partition was not inevitable until very late in the game, let's say around by the time the cabinet mission failed? And you think what made it ultimately inevitable was the British realization that it, their interests were better served by a divided India post their exit, which was which had to happen. They since they had been weakened. Absolutely. Uh, but to me, what's interesting is that you have highlighted that British saw that Pakistan would be an ally, whereas yeah. they did not trust Nehru, which is quite interesting given the in contemporary discourse in India, Nehru has been often criticized for being too anglophile and too much of a collaborator that somebody that British like person. Of course, it's interesting to get a very different perspective on that. I would like to um, uh, are you? I mean, I can. Uh, uh, go ahead. Otherwise, okay, I mean, I, back, I, and then I we can, move on to Dr. Raja. You want me to? So, like, uh, thank you. It's an honor to be with all the panelists, and sure. of course, I, I'm, I'm familiar with Dr. Istia Kamal's work. I've read it very carefully. Uh, so, I mean, yes, I mean, I agree with Dr. Ishtiak Ahmed that uh, it was, uh, it wasn't, I mean, when you, the moment you invoke the term inevitability, it becomes natural. Nothing is natural in history. History changes because of agential acts of collectives and individuals. So it goes without saying. Now, I'm not a historian and I'm not a political scientist. You know, I'm a literary scholar. So what we lack is the substantive knowledge of history and a clear understanding of the political theory. But where we have an advantage is to read language at its poetic level, right? Where language no longer sometimes means what it says. Uh, so I agree with that. And But I think I would like to argue here uh, that... To attribute the entire project of partition to Britain, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. There are historical facts behind it, but it then uh, then we assume that there were two passive entities, right? The Indian National Congress and Muslim League, and that upon those passive entities were overwritten the text of the British Empire. I think we need to give some credit to. Uh, 
to the people who were actually agitating for the partition or not, right? And 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 they, we need to create that room there, the acts of agency by people on opposing sides of it. Uh, but I agree with Dr. Ishtiakim that there was nothing inevitable about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, just like, you know, I have all the transfer documents sitting here and, and here are like four or five, six books that came out in the 1940s on the quest. Everyone was talking about and writing about the partition from 1940 till 1946. I mean, I think the best book is, uh, is uh, Rajendra Parshad's book on, on division of India. So, so that's where I will stop. I mean, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Um, can we uh, let move on, Dr. Sujita? You can you before uh, we we can't hear you, ma'am. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, sorry. Yes. I said the very idea no of worries. inevitability in history. I have a problem with that because I think it then precludes any possibility of agency on the part of historical actors. I mean, if something is inevitable, then, you know, there's nothing more to it. But coming to an empirical level and coming to India and coming to the partition, the whole notion of inevitability is predicated upon a colonial idea, a colonial construction, namely that Hindus and Muslims were, that there were irreconcilable differences between the two from time immemorial. And it was these differences which made India a uh, uh, a zone of warring groups, warring tribes, if you like. And the British, the colonial regime took the credit for unifying India, which is, as I said, totally a con colonial construction. There is nothing that we uh, accept in that. So there is a politics to this whole idea of uh, inevitability of partition, which I said uh, comes around this theory of irreconcilable uh, differences. Um, now, you know, uh, I'm always reminded when we talk about inevitability of a couple uh, who has separated, who's got divorced, and they are sitting back at some point in time separately, and they are looking back to a point to identify that moment when it was clear that the love that was there earlier wasn't there anymore. And I think the writing on partition is because partition has been so unhappy a legacy for our two countries, Pakistan and India, there is a sense of regret. I come from a refugee family myself. My parents were in Lahore. And they, you know, made the trudge across the border to Delhi. And, you know, we grew up in a refugee colony. So that sense of loss is very much there and looking back. And so, as I said, this idea of inevitability is also linked to this idea of what Professor Ishtiag Ahmed hinted at, that there is no such thing. That is a point of no return. And it's interesting that in the historical writings on partition, that there is an attempt to identify such a point. What I also call the ifs of history, you know, so 1937, if only there had been a coalition in UP, partition wouldn't have happened. Or 1946, if Congress had accepted the cabinet mission plan, maybe we could have avoided partition. So this idea of identifying that point of no return is, I said, also very much linked with this whole idea of inevitability, which I think uh, is an exercise which is best uh, not undertaken because it doesn't really get us anywhere. Yes, I'm also of the opinion 
that what we can best do here is to take a quick look at the processes which unfolded you know uh in those last years uh leading up to 15th august uh 1947 what were those i'm not talking about landmarks but the processes and here i think there's no doubt in my mind that we first need to look at it even however old fashioned or hackneyed we may uh, you know people to they call it but the first process we need to look at is very clearly the divide and rule policy of the colonial government and here i'm underlining that aspect which has earlier also been highlighted which is that at no point before 1946 did the british think of quitting india it's only in that speech made by the secretary of state uh, on 1st january 1946 where they say that we are planning to leave india in the coming few years there's no date yet so the british were not thinking of wrapping up their rule not at all now as far as we look at the um jinna is concerned now jinna certainly made that demand for pakistan and he meant it i i don't buy the aisha jalal uh, argument at all that it was a kite flown and a bargaining counter he didn't really want it no, no. i think we are doing disservice to jinna and to the people of pakistan i think more also where if we uh, say that no you know they didn't want it it was something which was thrust on them but it would interest our audience uh, to know that pakistan wa was not taken seriously either by the british or by the congress for a very long time if you look at the newspapers around 1940 you will find hardly any discussion on them when crips mission comes there is some talk about smuggling in pakistan through the back door the talk about self determination of provinces cr formula again a little bit when gandhi goes walks up the hill malabar hill to gan to jinnah's house in the famous uh, gandhi jinnah talks pakistan is not being talked about gandhi is talking about rights of muslims and gandhi ji is offering that as an elder brother the hindus should be generous towards the muslims now whether we like that analogy or not is a different matter but the congress responsibility for partition i would say does not lie in what today uh, very often you know it's put at the door of nehru and patel they were tired you know they had been in jails they wanted power i think that's that we are barking up the wrong tree very clearly i think that the congress weakness was that they did not give a strong ideological fight to the muslim league they never took it seriously even as late as the elections of 1946 they were not taking it seriously when the league made it a referendum almost for pakistan the congress was still fighting on the platform of anti imperialism so i think they should have waged an ideological struggle and last of all i think that gandhi ji to again there's so much about how gandhi could have uh stopped partition he was very clear about it there's a beautiful sentence that he said when nk bose who was his interpreter said to him that why don't you do something you can stop what's happening and he said you know um i don't have any magic wand uh by which i do something he said i am unhone matlab he he the analogy was in hindi kumhar he said i am a potter he said i just take the clay that is there and by that he meant the people he said i take the clay that is there and i give it a shape but today i look around, around me and i don't find any sign of that and he says when i look around i find that people are communalized and that's where the real weakness in india lay eventually much after the role of the british and what jinnah did it was that a time came in the summer of 1947 when the people were getting had got communalized gandhi ji said he said he said don't blame the muslims he said 
the hindu and the khalsa wanted it i stop at that right now thank you thank you dr marjan on that note about gandhi that um i think he also is quoted as saying that i uh, partition would happen over my dead body or my coffin box so he vehemently opposed gandhi but there is a view out there that while his words opposed partition his actions didn't keep up with those words i'll bring abhijit chavra on this one as he's been fairly vocal on this topic Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me for this discussion, and it's a great honor to be in the company of such august uh, scholars. Great to be with you all. So, like you said, I've been vocal about this, and I see history as I don't see history as a collection of quotes. I don't see history as something that you study chronologically. I see history as something that is happening in real time. and the at any given point in time there's a number of forces that's acting on a on a particular culture society geographical region for instance these these forces could be internal forces external forces political forces geopolitical forces and all that let's look at afghanistan what happened in the past 20 years the americans came in in 2001 and the geopolitical climate was very different today it's very different when they have left so the forces that are at play are always changing so if we look at the past 200 years of india's history let's begin with the uh, time when the british became a major player after the anglo maratha wars so by the 1750s the marathas had essentially reconquered india from the moguls they had established a large empire and then the british became a major player they started capturing territory which gave them political power they started having their own militias their own army which gave them political power and control over the country and eventually they captured the trade they monopolized the trade they destroyed the local industries and all of this gave them complete control over the country not just control over the land but the control over the industries and then they created in the late uh, 19th century this political party to so to supposedly shepherd in a moderate way the indian political uh, struggle for independence the congress party which is a creation of the british and as we can see all the leaders in the congress party were all english educated anglophiles with the exception of one or two people like mr patel sardar patel so political power it can comes from actual street power if you need to have an army you need to have a militia you need to have complete control it's about uh, these uh, these networks of control and power so that's how the british established power over india and that's how they consolidated it in the in the early 20th century the only major political power in india was the british empire and the muslim league and the congress party they did not have any real political power they they popularity and power are completely different things power comes from the barrel of a gun like mao zedong said it also comes from the blade of a sword and the more people you have at your disposal who will obey you unquestioningly the more power you have and that's what the british had they had the british indian army and they had these political outfits at their disposal the congress party and even the muslim league is to some extent their creation and it's ironical that jinnah opposed the creation of the muslim league he was a secularist he was in favor of hindu muslim unity and brotherhood and a unified india so these are the powers the forces that were at play in india and there is no inevitability about partition when you have a subcontinent sized geography such as india with so much plurality and diversity then you're going to have lots of different opinions lots of different agendas and a geography such as india it needs a very towering leader to unify it and take it together and the last such leader who had a chance of doing that was subhash chandra bose and once subhash chandra bose was ousted and made irrelevant at that time in my opinion partition became inevitable because if you look at subhash chandra bose and his indian national army you had hindus muslims sikhs buddhists and who who and what not who fought together lived together bled together and died together for a free united india look at habibur rahman his his uh, right hand man so to say he fought for india for the fought for a free united india and once subhash chandra bose was sidelined made marginalized that's when habibur rahman saw that people like uh, mr Mo, mr gandhi and mr nehru 
where we're going to take india in a direction that he did not agree with he did not that was not his vision of india and therefore he found it better to go with a with the with the new new country of pakistan because that is that was more in line with the kind of vision that he had but so it's all about leadership if you have the right leader even today india pakistan afghanistan everybody would unite you know with the right kind of leadership it is always leadership that is critical in this matters india in the past let's say 500000 years hasn't had the kind of one leader who can unify the country and that's what india has always lacked so when mr bose was sidelined by these by the by the forces at play by, by the powers that's when partition became inevitable and like i said geopolitical agendas change when the americans came into afghanistan they had a totally different agenda and when they have left today they have a different agenda because the world has changed and similarly in the early 20th century the world was different after the second world war the british were near bankrupt and they were no longer in a position to hold on to india and therefore they engineered an exit strategy that was beneficial towards them they had geopolitical interests in the middle east in the gulf region oil and all that and therefore they desired to have a part of india that was very strongly pro britain very strongly pro west and that was pakistan so in in a nutshell that is why they engineered partition it was all a geopolitical game and it became inevitable when the last true indian resistance in the form of subhash chandra bose was defeated so that's when partition became inevitable in my opinion thank you may i also oh, other speakers thanks abhijit i want to bring you uh, mr raja just very quickly two observations which we can cover later in the debate one thing is what struck to me and i would like to understand more from you is you think gandhi was a great powerful enough leader to prevent partition but you think but at that another time you said we we lack strong leadership because after both had gone so it seems like a bit of a contradiction and then there is another point which we sort of which every speaker so far for so far has mentioned that the britain it was in britain's interest for this to be divided but um are there that's not a universal view i would just like to quote uh, professor anita inder singh um she wrote the british favored a transfer of power to united india which would keep the the royal army undivided and be to the greatest advantage to them strategically if nehru and jinnah both were anglicized barristers from london who the british loved engaging with why would they want the country to get divided they would could have cooperated with either of them in a post independence future uh once again first uh, dr raja you wanted to make a point and then we get to mr shahan but i want to move on to doctor may i answer the question may i answer the, the, the points quickly may I quickly uh, respond Okay, but keep it short because I wanted to. Yeah, come of course, certainly. Yes. So, first of all, I have never said that Mr. Gandhi was a powerful leader. He was made popular by by various means, but popularity is not leadership. Do you think he could have prevented the partition? No, he could not. Happening? No, no, no. Okay. He could not have prevented partition. Okay. He was not in uh, in in the. Uh, he was not. Uh, it was not his intention to prevent prevent partition. Secondly, quotes don't matter. What people say don't matter. What no, no, Abhijit, matters. you didn't. Say, sorry, Abhijit. Just you. You. You were saying it was not his intention. That's not the question. Do you think if he said always that he yeah. does not want partition, if he was true to his word, could he have stopped partition? That was no. He was. It was never he on. His, it was never his agenda to stop the partition. He was a British agent. He never wanted that. Doesn't matter what words he said. He no, said no, no, all my dead body, but he did nothing. Let's nothing just, to stop. Let's it. just stick to the point. Could he have? Let's assume for a minute he wanted to. Could he have done it? No, he could not have. If the British did not want okay. partition, if the British wanted a partition, Gandhi could not have opposed it. And the okay, British so you lay all the power with the British. Okay, absolutely. Agreed. And then so, the other point, you think British definitely wanted India to be divided? Yes, yes, absolutely. It doesn't matter what they said. What they did matters. Military commanders, some of them may have been against partition, but the politicians are the ones who were truly in power. The military. is answerable and it takes orders from the politicians and these are these are the people who control the geopolitical uh, direction in which a country goes so that's okay. the short so you, you raised a lot of points on which everybody wants to counter i think come in sure. on different points but i want to give an opportunity to mr sudeep to sudeep kulkarni first ma'am sujita mahajan uh, ma'am we'll come to you right after let let mr kulkarni come in and with his opening comments uh thank you thank you for inviting me to be part of this discussion let me begin by expressing conveying my greetings to all the people of uh, india pakistan bangladesh on the occasion 
of this year that's the beginning of the 75th anniversary of india's independence there are two ways of approaching this subject one is looking at the past and the other is looking at the present and the future i am less interested in looking at the past and more interested in looking at the present and the future because partition is a reality it cannot be undone what is important now and into the future is can we undo the negative effects of partition and there are many negative effects which i'll i'll come to of course it's important for us to know why partition happened how partition happened what were the factors that contributed to it in my view the first and foremost factor is the policy of divide and rule by the colonial masters they knew that a free india and a united india would emerge as a very strong power on the world scene which would of course overshadow the west in due course of time so divide and rule policy of the british secondly the weakness of the indian national movement it has been referred to by dr mahajan earlier the weakness of the people we were not united enough throughout the course of the freedom movement and those weaknesses really manifested in the last decade of the freedom movement the weaknesses due to different perception and perspectives of uh, uh, the elite of the muslim community and the hindu community the third factor is the obduracy of jinnah and the muslim league uh, in the in the final years of uh, the freedom movement they took to some absolutely unpardonable unpardonable acts such as a direct action in bengal which led to mass killings on a horrendous scale and that made many people in the congress believe that now it is not possible to continue as a united nation they feared civil war and therefore the the commitment to unity of the nation somehow became weaker in the congress party and of course a very important factor that led to partition and the kind of partition that actually happened was the partition of punjab subsequently the decision to divide bengal too had punjab remained united and yet partition happened perhaps the history of india would have been very different but uh, as uh, professor ishtiaq ahmed has said in this in this discussion and of course he has uh, uh, argued with meticulous research in his book the punjab bloodied partitioned and cleansed i think the game was lost when punjab or the leaders of punjab on both sides on the muslim side as well as the hindu and sikh side decided to divide the province and uh, last factor is the absolutely irresponsible role that the british played in the final months of uh, india's freedom movement the unplanned hasty exit something that you know we can see even in the way the americans left afghanistan in total chaos what happened in india was a chaos of a much much bigger scale leading to bloodshed and mass migration the largest by mass migration in, in in human history it is best captured by stanley wolpert's book shameful flight in my opinion there were 
efforts right through the the 20th century to somehow strengthen hindu muslim unity and thereby make india both free and keep it united a landmark effort in this direction was the tilak jinnah pact in lucknow in 1916 when the two parties i mean it's remarkable that the congress and the muslim league held their annual sessions in the same city almost side by side and with great uh, with a great show of camaraderie and unity now had the spirit of the lucknow pact been kept intact perhaps things would have been different the next landmark effort to keep india united was uh, the gandhi jinna talks in 1944 september 1944 when at gandhi ji's own initiative he went to jinna's house at malabar hill in, in bombay and for 18 continuous days they held talks and i am really i'm really aghast when one of the panelists said that uh, mahatma gandhi was a british agent i mean it shows utter ignorance of india's history mahatma gandhi made very sincere efforts to stop to prevent partition or at least the kind of partition that ultimately happened let me quote a few lines from his dialogue his talks with jinnah he said can you not agree to differ on the question of two nations and yet solve the problem on the basis of self determination the more i think of the two nation theory the more alarming it appears to me i am unable to accept the proposition that the muslims of india are a nation distinct from the rest of the inhabitants of india mere assertion is no proof the consequences of accepting such a proposition are dangerous to the extreme once the principle is admitted there would be no limit to the claims of for cutting up india into numerous divisions which would spell india's ruin i have therefore suggested a way out and this is very important he says i have therefore suggested a way out to you to jina let there be partition if necessary as between two brothers if a division must there there be let the, let us part as brothers of a family it happens many times that brothers separate but still they maintain good relations that is the kind of uh, future mahatma gandhi wanted unfortunately it did happen but as i said friends what is past is past we cannot undo it what is important now is can we undo the negative effects of partition what are the negative effects that we have left the kashmir issue unresolved india pakistan relations continue to be extremely hostile thank you pakistan, sir democracy has, uh, has uh, almost become non existent or become subservient to military rule and in india itself we are seeing once again a certain polarization of hindu muslim uh, on hindu muslim lines and as a result the whole of south asia the largest the most populous region in the world 1.7 billion people it is today the least integrated it is home to the largest number of poor people and we can't prevent you know just look at afghanistan afghanistan is part of civilizational family and we have so, taken absolutely no role in preventing the disaster that happened in the last 40 years in afghanistan and therefore my final submission is that this discussion should not be an academic discussion on what happened whether it was inevitable or not what is important is that we must prevent such things happening again and we must create strong unity within india as well as strong unity in all of south asia the core of which is india pakistan normalization brought about by hindu muslim harmonization thank you okay so uh, may i just uh, one second sir uh, just very quick point um you mentioned british divide and rule policy as was already mentioned 
several times before but that policy was not devised when britain were britain was planning to exit that was a policy they had been using for over a century already and so my my question is at this point when they were looking to exit even if was it still possible that the that the you know, partition could have been prevented or by that time the relations had soured so much that it just had to happen one way or another and second thing you mentioned uh, that congress had given up and they just had accepted partition as with also dr sujeta mahajan had said that if congress had put up a big stronger ideological fight to the muslim league this could have been prevented do you agree with that no i'll make very brief points the second question first the congress commitment to keeping india united became weak in the in the final years of the freedom movement and it is best captured by dr ram manohar lohia's excellent book the guilty men of partition and lohia says how it was only mahatma gandhi and then abul kalam azad only these two leaders stood firmly against partition almost till the very end may i intervene here i mean let just let him finish and then we'll come to dr raja and then we'll come to dr m and, and then sujit mahajan ji please then the first yes, question please keep it brief you see yes. i agree with you that the british idea of divide and rule did not uh, did not uh, take birth in the final stages of india's part in freedom movement not at all they were they were colonialists they were foreigners they had colonized india and they knew that their colonial rule would come to an end some day so right from the beginning we see right from 1857 their agenda was to divide hindus and muslims they may have been ups and downs but it was a it was a consistent policy to keep indian society divided so that ultimately indian nation would be divided correct and they brought this view that political representation should be based on religion let me get dr Ra- masood raja on this so okay so uh, let me yes, i agree uh, with uh, your point that we should look towards the future because i think that's a place of more possibilities but i mean so simply the divide and rule policy first of all it happens like through acts of the british like my reading of post 1857 was that the muslim elite felt their very existence threatened by the british not by the hindus okay and i accounted for it in my book in in terms of reading you know sabab e bagawat e hind and all so to imagine the indian freedom movement in universal terms i think is a big mistake that all of us make it was never a universalist view of independence because muslims aligned themselves with the british as a way of survival so the muslim elite 1858 1859 are writing themselves literally into the british hegemonic project the only holdouts are the ulama of deoband right they are the ones who say we are going to withdraw from that and that's historically recorded secondly so my idea is that by 1858 1880s the idea of muslim exceptionalism in their treatment by the british had already taken shape right it may not have been a political identity but muslim elite felt that their existential identity is under threat and they need to develop a language of loyalism right so that's what we ought to keep in mind going to the future i mean i live in united states of america right we have students from india pakistan bangladesh if anywhere in the world two or three nations have the most in common to build a common future maybe not as unified nations but as a confederacy a regional confederacy i think we have that possibility in terms of culture in in terms of heritage and and, and that you me and everyone else we should be working towards it as scholars and as intellectuals and that would be a worthy goal but it's not going to work if we keep blaming each other 
right? If if Pakistanis keep blaming the Indians and Gandhi ji, right. and that's let not going to work. Let me bring in Dr. Ahmed on. He wanted to make a point. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. You know, when you say one or two or three minutes to make your presentation, I take it very seriously, and then I see all the speakers taking their time to say what they want to, and uh, that's a bit unfair. Uh, I agree entirely with uh, Dr. Raja that it was the Muslim elite which felt threatened, uh, which felt dislodged by the British taking over India from the Mughals. Simple as that. But then the thing one has to add is that the separatist movement was meant to defeat the idea of democracy, of power sharing, of all communities uniting their ranks to get rid of the British. So I don't see that very logical that the power which threatens you is the one that you become loyal to and you deny the, the loyalty due to all other Indians in the subcontinent who may want to create a free democratic India. So I think that's where we disagree because the consequences have been disastrous. The separatist movement is based on the real, imagined, contrived fear of a permanent Hindu domination over Muslims. And I have shown if people have, I don't know how many have read my uh, book on Jinnah, that this was actually uh, uh, fabricated through sheer reputation by Jinnah, saying that Islam, Islam will be annihilated, that the Muslims will be obliterated, that when the first Indian converted to uh, Islam, that's when the foundations of Pakistan were laid. So these are not things which the run of the mill ulema or some mad Pakistani says. These are words of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He demonized, dehumanized Hindus. Of course, the caste system is evil, but that's not the only thing which was uh, true about, in, about Hindus. There was their ability to assimilate and to accommodate a lot of religions and Jinnah was fully aware of that. So what I think is problematic is that if the elite felt this way, actually Sir Sayyid, I've recently done a video on where he's so contemptuous of the ordinary Muslims, the converts, for example, saying that, uh, would you like an, a, 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 a Kamzad Muslim getting a BA or MA and having a position of authority and then telling us what to do? Would you accept it? And the Muslim Ashrafia then cheered him. No, no, no. So that's the attitude that uh, Sir Sayyid and his followers and Jinnah took it very late, by the way. To his defense, he had been an Indian nationalist. I have said he was a Muslim communitarian seeking some sort of power sharing uh, within a very loose federation. Although I think it was a problematic position he took. People have not talked about the real effort of the Congress to sit together, brainwash, brainstorm, and then come with the Motila Nehru report. It's a fantastic report for accommodating the federal nature of India and yet having an, an effective center to run that India. Because of the mosaic of caste, religions, cults, sects, you needed a strong government on education, on development, and, and so many other things. So the Congress was absolutely justified in saying, we want a united federal India, but with a strong center, which the Muslim League rejected. And then if we were to talk about what Pakistan ultimately Jinnah created, it was a hundred times more centralized than India ever has been. So Jinnah used all those arguments to justify the division of India, using religion, using caste, using the fact that the money lender happened to be a Hindu. I mean, all these things were done deliberately and the result is the partition. So I don't have an idea of a passivity of, of, of the political actors, not at all. I find them very active coming to the defense of the Congress or to their stupidity. They were for three years 
at a very critical critical part uh, of of history sitting in jail quit india movement so how could they come be, uh, come out in june 19 uh, uh, 45 and start campaigning uh, on a positive note or on a confident note the elections which were called so congress by going to jail to the quit quick quit india movement uh, uh, really enabled the muslim league to make a breakthrough day in and day out jena would tell muslims that the only way that islam can be saved is that we create a strong pakistan and if the hindus give any trouble to the muslims in the minority areas then we are responsible to take military action this is all given in my jena book it's called the hostage theory that yeah but what you are you know what i'm trying to say then is that the partition was not inevitable but it was definitely made possible by the very strong determined effort of mohammed ali jinnah and the muslim league that factor has to be brought in i mean that's that's what I mean. thank you sir as a follow all the follow up is all the time Sorry, I mean, Doctor Rajan. I want to push you, Doctor Mahajan, one second. Sorry. I can't hear him. Uh, I don't to hear Doctor Raja. Yes. What I'm saying is, Doctor Sab, that that is the national narrative in Pakistan that Muhammad Ali Jinnah single-handedly created Pakistan, and in no, that. No, but no, no, yeah. no. Let me tell you, Raja Sab. This the narrative is exactly what you are saying, but I'm saying it. He did it because he was hands in glove with the British. Had the British not backed him, he had no chance. of getting oh, yeah. the partition that's what oh, i'm that's, saying that's that's the even at the last moment when mount patton hands in the plan mount patton knows that jinnah doesn't have the popular following to say no right uh, we so know as that. a town i would like to take a town to view to that just for the sake of it there is an argument okay that had the congress really wanted to avoid it yes we all love to put, put it squarely with jinnah but had the congress really wanted to avoid it and they are the ones who were the advocates of democracy why did not they ask for a universal referendum do you think the whole country would have ever supported um, the division of india there is actually um uh, there vice for lord bevel actually wrote to lord petrick lawrence secretary of state for india on 20th november 1945 a vote of the whole adult population or of the enfranchised population would be unlikely to provide the results that jinnah requires that side good 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 but but i mean both congress and let me say even muslim league are on record saying we want adult universal adult adult franchise is the british should in grant it so the congress could not have forced the british hand when the british were to decide the future of india so this demand on them is unreasonable who didn't give universal adult franchise the british didn't and you are absolutely right had this been put to vote where everybody voted on it there was no chance of a partition true i mean that conclusion is correct and you think the british still had that much power by the time of 1945 or 46 of they course. still had that level of power they had control absolutely. of the army sure but the politics absolutely now that's that's something which we dr mahajan i masood raja and all of us are unwilling to admit that many indians were still wanting the british to stay on you had the caste system oppressing hindus by hindus you had muslims oppressing their own caste their own sex there were christians there were the dalits wanting the british to stay on and you had the maharajas many maharajas is one what about the british indian army which remained loyal till the very end so people who were yeah. employed by the british wanted the british so, to stay on doctor doctor british Sulkar sorry the british the be... british could not stay on because they were living on ransom food you know russian food their economy was smashed and the americans forced them to transfer that, power that's, that's exactly what i think the british had to leave no matter they had to what. leave had, they had to had leave push hard maybe we yes. could have got a referendum that just this is hard to put in there i want to bring in dr mahajan she wanted to make a point earlier but ma'am before you do i want to also uh, i want you to address the thing that dr ishtiaq ahmed brought up putting making jinnah as sort of instrumental to bring about this strong demand 
um do you agree and this is a view uh, which i want to bring up th- that it was gandhi support for khilafat movement that ultimately led to this kind of mobilization among muslims that jinnah's message got such a powerful following you want to quickly make if you got no, you have let dr muhajan respond you know i believe in proper order she has the right and then if you give me a chance i'll speak i'll not speak out of turn okay no, no, perfect sure. thank you so uh, i'm i'm sorry professor ishtiaq ahmed that you spoke very little we have a you know tendency to speak till we are asked to shut up so i know uh, i do. <laughs> but i am <laughs> trained in a different way i have yes. i'm trained to speak for just two three minutes that's all <laughs> i know i didn't anyway. hear it well yeah. anyway uh, just to take up uh, two points one is i for the sake of you know even if one is being uh, hackneyed i'm repeating this again the british in responsibility for the partition of india needs to be underlined day in and day out i think not only because of academic reasons at all but and of course there we know that so much of the scholarship which comes out of uh, cambridge in particular you know whether you have joya chatterjee or you have uh, aisha jalal neeti nair and the, you know many others there is a tendency to put the blame on the indian actors that's right that's right particularly yeah. on the congress and certainly on jinna now jinna should not be made the villain of the piece so huh? jinna was acting out of whatever were the historical compulsions and he made a demand he came up with a theory which suited his politics yes uh, when uh, professor ishtia kemad is here i'm not going to expand on that the point is that in the last 7 years after the pakistan demand it's not only that the congress is sitting in jail congress leaders for 3 years and jana has time to expand of course and he did wonderfully in punjab and bengal at that time but also this is when right after 1945 when the leaders come out of jail and they are sent up to shimla for the shimla conference lord wavell the viceroy allows the shimla conference to be wrecked exactly basically at the at the door of he allows it to be wrecked by jina who is exactly. insisting on a very simple word which is veto power yes, that sir. he has the veto he will decide who the representative muslims are that is it was not a question of whether mulana azad could come in or not it was the allies of the british in punjab the unionist party and the british wanted to reward them by giving them a seat in the executive council but uh, jina said no so it's very important in the cabinet mission plan again very important that all the while there was an ambiguity they were telling jina in the morning that look this is all about pakistan compulsory grouping and you've got your pakistan and then they would go and meet jina uh, no, they would meet gandhi at 4 am and take a walk with him and they would say nahi nahi bap you know gandhi no no there's no uh, we are not thinking of this we want the unity uh, of india we have always been for the unity so it was the british ambiguity and i would even say that duplicity that duplicity. is very much there in all these actions mm-hmm. and a very important point on this which is that do notice that eventually what have the 3rd june what was announced was an award the 3rd june plan was the mount batten award it mm. was the partition award there was no signature no indian leader sat there and signed you know just as an aside um, if you go to shimla to the indian institute of advanced studies which is in the res, uh, precincts of the old vice regal house the rashtrapati nivas you the guide will take you to a room and show you a table and say ye table hai na is par is tarah nehru sahab baithe is tarah jinnah sahab baithe aur yahan par unhone dastakat kare partition so i was a fellow at the institute many years ago and i told our director that i said sir you know this is totally a historical and you know we shouldn't be doing this and he said 
Sucheta, let them make some money, you know. If unless you have a story, how is history <laughs> going to sell? So anyway, maybe I get quiet. I also like a story. But about Gandhi ji, I would really appeal to my friend Abhi, you know, Abhi ji Chanda. That what is the point of making a comment like Gandhi was an agent of the British? I don't think. This I is think this was a horrible thing. Getting us. anywhere at all he could not have been an agent of the british he was the most stoic and the greatest freedom fighter of them all and you know we are not on that kind of social media platform where we are just taking pot shots at people let's not let's not do this the kind of comment which you know we people make about nehru being a muslim and you know etc was so let's not say that but about gandhi ji I'm at the moment finishing a book on Gandhi in his last. It's called Gandhi Ji's Last Year, and it's about Noakhali and Bihar and you know the whole anti-communal tours that he undertakes. And I mean, look at what that man is trying to do. Earlier, what we said was that he reaches a point where he feels that he's not getting anywhere. He's not getting anywhere with Muslims. He's not getting anywhere with Hindus. the point is not what ultimately happened the point is what he tried to do he cut himself away from delhi nehru begged him we need you over here nehru even said you know look what he does he is going around putting on you know ointment on the sores on the body which he should be trying to find out the uh, a medicine which can cure the sores but gandhi ji said no gandhi ji had one way of looking at life he said as in the microcosm so in the macrocosm he was of the belief that if he was able to find a way out to world of reaching communal harmony in other villages of noakhali if he could heal the wounds uh, of the hindus there the wounds of the muslims of bihar then he could do that in the country as a whole but as i said by uh by july by june by july when he's in delhi and he's having his evening prayer meetings he's confessing his inability the ma- But, and people are uh, getting he, up and saying they are saying look ma'am uh, you you uh, you were the one who said partition over my dead body and he said yes i said that but when i said that i thought i had the country with me but now you people the hindu the khalsa you people also want partition so his inability in the end his weakness was the weakness of the people so that is where the you know we can look at gandhi we, it is not that uh, i'm not at all saying that he could have prevented uh, what happened not at all if there was anyone who could have prevented partition it was the people who proposed partition and implemented it and that was the british but what about the khilafat movement do you think his support for khilafat movement going back to the 1920s helped in alienating muslims and help in gaining support for the two nation theory when the muslim league proposed it you know this is a view which has been put forward that gandhi mixed up religion with politics and his support to the khilafat movement is also taken as an example of that now that's not true yes, at all that uh, you know he was he took up an issue it was also a political issue because you know the ottoman empire was defeated and the khalifa was defeated and it was an issue which of course affected muslims as a whole it was a pan islamic issue as it were and yes hindus uh, and muslims did come together non cooperation movement did get tied up with the khilafat movement but i personally don't think that there was anything to it at all anything wrong i think every religion every leader speaks in the idiom of his people in when baba ramchandra went and talked to the peasants of raibareli in 1921 in the eka movement he used to give analogies from he used to give uh, recite the chopais from the ramayan of tulsidas and the muslims of those areas of up were familiar with the chopais of the ramcharit manas that is the culture of that part so, when people that would be an assumption 
but that no, would just make it. what yes, many sure, people sure. say on the same lines that oh gandhi ji used the word ram raj and that was alienated people no people after all can he go and say this is utopia how is a peasant ek bataiye aap ek kisan jo hai wo samjhega ye baat utopia no he will talk in the language of the people Thank that's you, why he said ram raj what do you have to ram raj i i want to go to abhijit i who i know who is going to be countering this and obviously he is a subject of geopolitics but before we go to abhijit i think dr ishta came wanted to make a quick comment on this point about khilafat movement so let's let's do that sir yeah it is one of the myths fostered by people who have not gone and checked the uh, material which is relevant to the khilafat movement first of all jena was part of the muslim league delegation of 1919 which went to england to plead the case that the uh, ottoman empire's territories in the middle east at least should be left to them as was promised before the war and the uh, khalifa should also be allowed to continue as the spiritual head of the muslim community then in 1920 there is a famous speech i have quoted in my book where he said that first they took away our liberty and is referring to the rawlat acts and now they are taking away our faith which is the spoliation of the ottoman empire and khilafat these are his his words both were on the same page the muslim uh, radicals including ulama deoband you know who supported the congress party i mean it is the same people who later on remained steadfast in support of the congress who came to gandhi ji and said we need hindu support to confront the british so i think this was a positive well intentioned well meant input of gandhi ji to bring hindus and muslims together because muslims had been separated from the mainstream after 1909 act which gave them separate electorates separating them from the rest of the of the uh, population of india and you, and one and, and one thing more uh after that we don't see the ulama in politics at all so if if that was an event which brought them in where are they until jinnah brings them back in the 1945 46 election in the punjab sindh and and the rest where they give the slogans of pakistan ka nara kya la ilaha illallah and these are not the deoband jamiat ul mai hind these are the brelvi balwis and another <laughs> section of muslims another sect yeah 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 so so this is absolutely no without any foundation yeah thank you sir abhijit yeah so let me here. contextualize this entire discussion by referring to a uh, an incident that took place very late in the day in 1946 so in 1946 partition was very much on the table it was very much uh, the agenda of everybody and in uh, early 1946 there was this event that shook the british empire to its foundations there was a 1946 royal indian navy mutiny so this event took place for just 7 days it started in the city of bombay now mumbai when because of the horrible treatment meted out to indian sailors called ratings at the time these people rebelled the uh, principal instigators of this mutiny were hindus as well as muslims and within just two or three days it had spread all across the royal navy all across india and even asia in bombay in karachi in Col- in kolkata in the andaman islands in singapore east indies and even in the middle east more than 70 i think 78 ships rebelled against the british and they put up three flags each ship put up three flags the indian national congress flag the uh, muslim league flag and the communist party of india flag and this happened so rapidly that there was a real chance that even the royal indian um, the british indian army would get involved in this so the british deployed political powers immediately uh, mr gandhi and mr nehru uh, they they opposed this this uh, this mutiny mr jinnah also in the in the indian muslim league opposed this mutiny and only the communist party stayed in favor of the mutiny so quickly these uh, mutineers got demoralized they brought down the indian national congress flag the uh, muslim league flag 
and only the uh, communist party flag was flying then the british asked mr uh, patel to go to bombay and parley with the mutineers so mr patel came to bombay he talked to the mutineers he assured them that there would be no repercussions please stand down these people then eventually after a week or so stood down and they were immediately court martialed put to jail so this word that was given to them was immediately i mean it was uh, the british went against them now the problem the thing is that this mutiny caused larger actions in india there were riots in bombay and karachi the, the british army had to come into the picture more than 1000 people were shot in bombay shot to death and similar uh, casualties took place in karachi and there was this real possibility that there'll be a genuine rebellion in india a people's rebellion and the british power will disappear overnight if the indian army gets involved because the indian army already had this discontent because of what what was happening in the eastern border with the indian national army so the british deployed their political power very quickly and quelled the mutiny now the reason why the congress party and the muslim league opposed this is because the british the muslim league wanted pakistan pakistan was on the agenda at the time and the indian national congress wanted the handover power of power to their to their faction to mr nehru and mr gandhi so this mutiny could have destroyed these dreams of the british of the indian national congress and the muslim league and and as you can see they both the both opposed this thing because they were in favor of partition so the thing is the mutineers were hindus as well as muslims in the indian uh, national uh, in the uh, subhash chandra bose's army the fighters were indians hindus and muslims so this entire uh, this entire claim that india was communalized it was the fault of the indian people that is victim blaming it is not about communalization it is because of poor leadership and because that india was partition so that is the point i would like to make but you are making an assumption that the leaders would have been okay with a violent way to get rid of the british that contradicts the very and what is the problem with policy. violence to get rid of oppressors the Let's british killed more than 100 million indians but that was the policy on which congress was able to mobilize yes, so it doesn't the matter the congress indians. policy doesn't matter nation the it's nation is greater than the any millions policy. ideology the millions of indians that supported congress that went to listen to them were motivated by this philosophy when the american president writes letters to churchill saying that you have to end this that he is motivated by the cause that gandhi's ahimsa is creating waves and new york times is reporting it and it doesn't matter what the there. new york times says it doesn't matter it matters because they, they, they don't go to it matter to some people not to everybody but the mass mobilization is what creates pressure on the government which mass change. mobilization where what pressure did it create it is the army that created pressure is the military the one or doing but i let i let me talk to ahmed to come in and so actually let's go with dr raja sir we haven't so, had you in, in the conversation I, i first of all i salute uh, abhijit's passion right i mean it's not a question of whether we the sedate academics are right or whether he is right we are looking at history from two perspectives right some of us believe that okay it was okay to sit down and ask for your freedom maybe that's the part of history we like and some of us idealize the way there were nations that had to fight through blood like look at algeria and others that was the way that some of us idealize right aap log hindustan mein bhi hain hum pakistan mein every one of us calls 1857 the first rebellion right because we deep down in our minds we idealize resistance to the oppressors so i don't think so there is anything wrong with what you are suggesting but my point is apotheosizing people is not also great i don't believe in strong leaders that's micro fascism right i don't believe gandhi had all the answers or he was a saint or mr jinnah was perfect i mean gandhi we know was imperfect he had political exigencies that he had to work through otherwise kaise kyun wo ja ke kitab likhenge here are the duties of the bhangi you must do it right so let's keep in mind that these were human beings involved in real politics right and they had to develop certain personas right but other than that i am with uh, kulkarni ji i think we need to be thinking of a future right so sorry dr ishtiak please only thing i would add is understanding of past is helps us in our self perception yeah. in the society that's only yes sir dr ahmed please go ahead no no the thing is if we had this on the agenda that we'll talk about 
how India and Pakistan can mend their ways, then we should have devoted our time to that. If we have chosen to discuss, okay, was it inevitable or not, then it is our duty to focus on that. Indeed. Staying away is, is not, in my opinion, uh, uh, a good way of, of taking part in today's discussion. But coming now to the possibilities of an armed revolution, I've never ever heard that a spontaneous uprising leads to the overthrow of a whole state order known as the British Empire or any government anywhere in the world. This was confined to one or two ships in Karachi and maybe another couple in Bombay and that's all. And within two or three days, the British used overwhelming force and crush them. That's the truth. Second about uh, Subhash Pandar Bose and uh, the INA, I would like to speak a little about. Subhash Chandar Bose, why did he escape from India? He should have stayed on. If he believed that an armed revolution was possible, he should have mobilized people. He leaves India. He then goes to uh, Russia. Russia by that time was an ally of the British in the Second World War, he then goes to uh, Nazi Germany, knowing what the Nazis were doing, then comes to Japan and Japan had killed 25 million Chinese and they were in Singapore. Their record of dealing with political prisoners was awful. Many of the INA people didn't join it because they were motivated by the speeches of uh, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, maybe a few, most of them wanted to escape the extreme harsh conditions which the POW in a Japanese uh, uh, camp had to face. And, you know, once pa Pakistan and India came into being, Habibur Rahman that he names, he fought on in Kashmir for Pakistan, so did Major Kayani. And on the Indian side, one of the so-called uh, Colonel, uh, Gil, Nirjan Singh Gil, he is notorious among Muslims of East Pakistan for, for targeting them and killing them in the hundreds and thousands, in the thousands. So these people were opportunists at all stages in life. Some, some of them probably were converted to this uh, uh, INA philosophy, but very few. So let's not dramatize INA. And I don't think Subhash Chandra Bose was all that great a leader. Bhagat Singh, he in, in, in 1929 wrote a small piece saying that uh, Subhash Chandra Bose is a man full of enthusiasm, but he idealizes the past. It is Jawaharlal Nehru who is the revolutionary and who can lead us into the future. Bhagat Singh se bada kaun in hai? This is his uh, uh, judgment of, of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. Uh, I think many yeah, people in India these days have forgotten that Bhagat Singh had a very socialist point of view as well. That sort of like erased about his ideology when he's glorified. I want to bring in Dr. Kulkarni because he wanted to make a point. And then we'll yes. yes, sir. Mr. Kulkarni. Uh, you know, the title of this discussion is Was Partition Inevitable? And obviously, this uh, topic requires us to look at the past. And uh, there are scholars who, are, who you know, have studied this in depth and uh, they are uh, well placed to give a perspective on what happened in the past. I respect them. However, I, as I said in the beginning, partition cannot be undone. The creation of Pakistan and subsequently Bangladesh as separate sovereign nations is a reality that has to be accepted. There is going to be no Akhand Bharat. Yet, as neighbors, we have to live together. And therefore, what matters as much as the past is our duty towards the future. And here, I have a suggestion to make, which I've been making on many platforms, that uh, 2022 marks the 75th anniversary of India's independence, but also Pakistan's independence. It's Pakistan's independence as well as the creation of Pakistan. Now, this is a time, an ideal time, when India and Pakistan, as well as Bangladesh, because Bangladesh also got independence in 1947, even though it became a separate yeah, yeah. nation 
subsequently 1971. So my suggestion is that this is a time when the three countries should come together. The peoples of the three countries, as well as the governments of the three countries should come together and celebrate the 75th anniversary of independence from British rule jointly. Now this joint celebration will create the enthusiasm. It will also create the necessary understanding and knowledge that at some point in time, we were together, there were differences, but we fought against foreign rule together. And therefore, let us today, you know, there was a very good idea that was expressed earlier, that can we not come together as some kind of a confederation? Can we not make South Asia as a union on the lines of European Union? So let's think big for the future and act in that direction and make South Asia truly a land, a region of peace, prosperity, and living together as one family. Thank you, sir. That's a very beautiful uh, vision. I hope that materializes, I sincerely do. Um, I'm also, because we are sort of now closing the wedding to a time, um, I want everybody to sort of like make their concluding remarks. I want to bring in Abhijit because he wanted to make a point. Abhijit, please. Yeah, just a very brief point. Actually, this uh, yeah, Royal sure. Indian Naval Butany, it, in, it, uh, there were 78 ships, ships that took part in this and it was spread from Singapore all the way to the Middle East. So it is not factually correct to say that only two or three ships were involved. It was a very big uprising. It was quelled very quickly. And secondly, uh, like Dr. Kulkarni said that 1947 was when India got independence. We should all come together. I think that we should all definitely work together. We have absolutely nothing against the people of Pakistan, Bangladesh. We are the same people. We have come from the same heritage. The thing is, 1947 was a transfer of power. It was not really independence. It was given to us on the terms of the British. So we all need to all work together right. to actually decolonize ourselves and, and become one in some way or some form in the next 100 years or so. It's not going to happen overnight. We have too many differences, but we are ultimately the same people. We should find ways to cooperate, work together and make it a 100 year project. Let's try to first stop fighting and start talking. Thanks, That's a very uh, nice concluding line. Um, can I invite you, uh, Dr. Masood Raja? Uh, I mean, I am. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and for giving me the chance to interact with such eminent people. Uh, I am on record, both in my writing and in my public statements, that India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the entire region, we should be working towards coming together in a loose coalition because that's because we share so much in common we have but what we have done is for the last 75 he years we have built narratives of irreconcilability we have built narratives of distrust and that is where you me and the writers the poets come right it's our job to at least imagine a future in which we could love each other, which we could be friends, right, and equals. And I would love for you to maybe organize another session sometime in the future where we explore those possibilities, right, instead of, I know we need back. the past to learn from it, but the past is also the anchor to which sometimes we tie ourselves, right? So that's my hope. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the suggestion. We'll definitely work on it. Uh, can I invite you, Dr. Ishtia Kemis, for your concluding remarks? Well, let me say I have thoroughly enjoyed talking to my colleagues and I've learned a lot from them. Uh, Abhijit and I, in the end, are great friends because we all believe in the same thing, that we are one people, we have different religions, different languages. So bloody what? We live in Europe and you have Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs living in the same area, you know, on a daily basis associating and so on. The evidence is overwhelming that we are so much the same that keeping us uh, uh, apart and separate is a political project pursued by the elites. And I agree with uh, my very dear friend, uh, Mr. Kulkarni, that that partition is there to stay. There are three... Uh, uh, sovereign nations on the subcontinent and they have a right to exist as they are. 
we should learn from the european i mean i've written so much about it that when i heard my friend say this it's the same echo any sensible person who has his heart in the right place would believe in that 19 inevitability was wrong the partition has for 75 years delayed what we are all talking about had it not happened we would have picked the pieces already in 47 because 1000 years of living together had a lot to do with accommodation and understanding one another but 75 years later we still have to do the same thing so i think we are all raja saab uh, dr uh, mahajan there is nothing there are no basic differences on this and i'm very happy and greatly honored to have taken part in this discussion i wish india the you know great future pakistan the greatest future it is where all my family and friends are and in din bangladesh we are all the same people thank you so much thank you sir and um we'll conclude with dr sucheta mahajan ma'am will please your concluding remarks for today's session yeah uh, well thank you so much for uh, you know giving me so much time in this discussion and uh, i think uh, it was amazing how uh everybody kept uh, you know they cool and uh, you know put forward their points of view which were all very uh, at some point there was an essential agreement uh, when it came to the the view that whatever happened shouldn't have happened i mean <laughs> everybody there that sense of regret that sense of yeah, a loss yeah. and that sense that you know somewhere we can be together you know gandhi ji said this he did not uh, in 1947 when the india independence bill was passed so what did he say to the people he said let's not legislate on it he said well you know if the british are imposing pakistan or partition on us what we need to do is to keep the situation fluid not have passports in fact he was planning to go to pakistan mm. in january 1948 after his past intervened and uh, he said well you know I, i i dare anyone to ask me for a passport he also said something very interesting which i'll end with which he i think is important for us today he said that you know it's not about boundaries let if we don't accept partition in our hearts then a time will come then we will be able to reverse it my and that is i think what we are all talking about when we talk about a confederacy when we talk about you know i would say let's not even go in that direction right now it's too early uh, mm-hmm. you know 20 years ago there was some possibility but right now with the with the governments being the way they are you know all quite you know uh, hard nosed and hawkish kind of governments mm. that we have very unlikely that we are going to have a confederation but um something loose something which is based on people to people which builds on the love that the people have towards each other the people of uh, punjab the people of bengal you know they may be bangladesh it may be pakistan but the love that we get when we travel it's that what we need to from bottom up that's what we need to build upon then the politicians and others will also have to look to us so that's what i really hope for thank you ma'am well on that beautiful note we'll end today's session i thank all of you once again for joining us and hope that you will be with us in future again it was a pleasure to have you Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much.